morning. Good morning, good morning. How is everything with you? It's another lovely day in paradise. Well, apart from my uncle, who died the other day. Oh, I didn't know him very well. I knew him, I knew him about 40 years ago. But uh, he, uh, my father left the family when I was about 15, 14, 15. And so uh, he disappeared and his uh, family, his brothers and his mother disappeared with him. They sort of, uh, because my mother got custody of the children, because basically he didn't want custody because he he ran off with some single woman. Uh, they didn't want these children, so and she didn't want his children. <laughs> she only wanted him. So basically, his family decided that uh, I and my brothers and sisters and my mother were just basically. Uh, what's the word, cancelled, cancelled in the modern culture, we were cancelled from the family, so I didn't really uh, sort of uh, get to interface with him much and the, lost track with all my cousins on my father's side and and uh, a lot of my cousins on my mother's side have died all as well, so aunts and uncles are all dying off. Anyway, sorry about that. That was a bit morbid, wasn't it? Somebody said to me yesterday, how do you feel about it? And I'm like, oh, you know. All I feel is that um, you just move up the ladder, you know. Within your family, there's a big ladder of who's next to die. And everybody who dies just moves you one up the ladder until eventually you're at the top and you fall off. Fall off your perch. <laughs> anyway. Hopefully not for a couple of weeks, eh? Two big news stories overnight. Elon Musk, who said he was accepting Bitcoins for Teslas, has now said he's not accepting Bitcoins for Teslas. This is because I think the environmental lobby has got to him. He's sent a lot of uh, Teslas to environmentalists and they've said that going on about the um, energy cost of... Uh, of uh, Bitcoin is, uh, you know, it's just a good reason to not accept them, you know. Well, I don't think that the uh, energy cost of Bitcoin is a good reason for not adopting it, for what it is, either as a, a global replacement, sort of a fed wire on steroids for a global settlement system, which is the BTC, or the um, peer to peer cryptocurrency that can be exchanged uh, with anyone at zero cost you know, to all intents and purposes which is BCH, Bitcoin Cash although Dash is another uh, contender for worldwide cash, Bitcoin Cash or Dash much larger market of course I mean the market for Bitcoin BTC as a fed wire on steroids uh, the, it's, uh, it's sort of mooted to be about 10 trillion, which is about the market share of gold, which I don't think is a good comparison because uh, because the, the total value of the tokens at any one time in use on Fedwire is not related in any way to the total value of the gold market. So, you know, gold hasn't been used for settlement between countries for a long time so Fedwire I think uh, on the average transactions about 5 million and this is this is a system that settles debts between countries between large institutions big banks big massive companies you know if you get a Fedwire account it just allows you to transfer money anywhere you like in the world providing that uh, the Americans agree because they pretty well control it 
Um, Bitcoin Cash and Dash, on the other hand, are just uh, digital money. And uh, the global uh, money supply is about 100 trillion. And so you're, it's quite weird because you've got a token, BTC, worth about $50,000 that's chasing 10 trillion. And another token, BCH, which is about $1,000 which is chasing 100 trillion. So I know which I think is better value for money. But um, anyway. So that's uh, made it go down temporarily. Um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, Craig Wright, an Australian entrepreneur, and, uh, some would say con man, who was closely involved with uh, Bitcoin in the early days uh, and uh, who now claims to be the inventor of Bitcoin personally because I think the inventor of Bitcoin died um, so there's no one there to tell him he can't say that and uh, he's, he threatened to sue everybody because he says he had some coins and those coins were stolen from him Somebody hacked into his computer and got the password in effect and stole the coins and uh, he said that the people in charge of the software could put like an extra line in the code and give him those coins back and that he demands that they, uh, that they are firstly uh, accept responsibility for doing this and secondly uh, that they be forced to do it by the courts. Now, I mean, if that were to happen, then obviously Bitcoin and all cryptocurrencies would, would be an entirely different kettle of fish. Uh, they'd have an attack vector through the courts that uh, at the moment most people don't believe exists, and I don't believe exists, and I still uh, don't think it will succeed, because on the first hand, it's a bit like... Uh, it's a bit like someone saying, I lost a load of money in a bank robbery, right? Or a bank saying, this branch was like, uh, in my, my uh, branch was robbed and we lost five million pounds in the robbery. <coughs> and in cash, and the treasury could and should and must give us that cash back <laughs> because it's uh, you know I mean with Bitcoin you've got a bit more flexibility because you can at the same time blacklist the coins that uh, were stolen uh, at the same time as you reimburse reimburse the person who had their money stolen but there, there are knock on problems with that insofar as the stolen coins may well have been spent and respent and respent and respent and so blacklisting the stolen coins will be almost impossible uh, because the person who stole them is will have will have probably had the benefit of them by now and it'll just be innocent mugs like me who get told that they've got unspendable bitcoins so that's not really and then the other thing is that being open and open coded project in other words anyone can read the source code and download the source code and run the source code themselves alter the source code there's no there's absolutely no restrictions at all on uh, uh, how many times you can download the software and, and reinvent Bitcoin I think what would happen is that uh, Bitcoin would just split into two halves two it will split into two bitcoins the one that reimbursed uh, Craig Wright and the one that didn't <laughs> Um, and so he can have all the millions of bitcoins that uh, if the court orders that he gets these bitcoins back uh, but they'll be worth nothing you know they won't be listed on exchanges and no one will accept them they'll basically end up being Craig Wright bitcoins and then the fork branch which didn't have the adjustment in would, would go on and be the one that by common consensus was the one that everybody still used can't uh, start blacklisting coins 
in the same way as you can't start listing uh, blacklisting banknotes. Um, if you go in a shop and spend ten pounds on something and you get five pounds in in change, the the shopkeeper can't spend half an hour reading a book of numbers to see if your ten pound is on a blacklist. And similarly, you can't spend half an hour borrowing his book of numbers to read through whether the fiver he's given you is, is also on the blacklist. So money has to be acceptable, whether it was been involved in a crime or drug dealing or whatever. And that, that sort of uh, process of acceptability, our interchangeability, is, is called fungibility. That's its correct name. And fungibility means that every unit, no, whatever, coin, must be treated as identical to every other note or coin. Uh, and if you don't do that, then money can't function. And there was a very famous court case, I think, in the 1600s, uh, involving the Bank of Scotland, where a guy had two £50 notes stolen, and he had the serial numbers. And he told the bank to look out for these £50 notes to see if anyone paid them in. And sure enough, sooner or later, the bank rang him up in 1600 and said, uh, we've got your two £50 notes in. We've matched the, matched the watches. But they come from a bloke who's of the highest integrity and obviously not a thief and, you know, and didn't know that they were stolen, etc., etc. And he said, oh, well, that's, uh, I'm sorry... I'm sorry for him, or I'm sorry for you, uh, but uh, can I have them back? And the bank said, no, we've accepted them in good faith. Uh, if we give them back to you, we'll be out 100 quid. Oh, excuse me. So he said, uh, well he said in that case, you can debit the bloke who paid him in. Because he was obviously paying in stolen notes. It's his hard luck, you know. And the bank said, well we can't really do that. Because <laughs> he didn't know they were stolen, it's not his fault. So the whole thing went to court. With, uh, you know, three people potentially standing to make a loss because of these huggy 50 pound notes. And the court decided that um, he'd had the stuff, he'd had the notes stolen and, and he had to eat the loss. Because uh, basically the monetary system wouldn't work if the notes were blacklisted. And by giving the numbers to the bank, he wasn't, uh, you know, he, he couldn't have a reasonable expectation that the bank would hand them back to him when, he, when they found them. And that was, from that point onwards, there was the... Uh, principle of the fungibility of money came about and that's why you don't have to uh, worry if you take £100 out of an ATM that one of those notes might have been uh, used in or, or obtained through robbery or drug deal or something and, and therefore it will be, be of no use to you because it effectively be repossessed and the same goes with digital currency you can't these, the way digital currency works is that uh, there are no banknotes or coins as such. There are just amounts. And so you might have an amount of, say, uh, and there are no accounts, there are things called addresses. So you might have nine pounds, let's say, equivalent, in an address, and you might want to spend two pound fifty. And then, so what you do is you send the nine pounds to the uh, person that you're paying, and they take two pound fifty and send you six pound fifty back. And that's the beauty of the system is that they can't they can't take eight pounds and send you one pound back. They're only they can only take what they're due, and then they send you the, uh, the six pound fifty back. But you can't. Uh, so so basically, what you'll see from that is that your addresses will quite frequently get mixed up with coins. So you'll have. £6.50 back from one transaction and you'll have £1.23 back from another transaction and £261 back from another transaction. 
then you might want to make a payment of 290 quid and you'll find that uh, part of that 290 pounds has been flagged black, black, blacklisted because it's come from someone who got it from someone who got it from someone who stole it and you can do all that tracking but the, which you can't I mean you can with with notes really I because they obviously have got numbers on them but um, with uh, a Bitcoin that is sort of quite easy to do but that hasn't been implemented because uh, it wouldn't work as a settlement system and it wouldn't work as money if it didn't have that fungibility that basic fungibility that was agreed all those years ago in the 17th century so Craig Ryan saying that he wants to uh, start uh, blacklisting and reversing transactions through the courts and Elon Musk saying that he's not going to accept Bitcoin for Teslas uh, both uh, knock the price back a bit but to be honest with you the, the flow of money really in, in the space is from government fiat into crypto it's pretty much I know you need to be able to convert both ways for it to be useful but in fact, the net flow is, is inwards, yeah? To the point of tens of millions of pounds a day, a day. And so, when the net flow is, is into crypto, you want the price to be low, yeah? You don't want the price of crypto to go, start mooning. Uh, if you've been in the space for a long time and you see the price go down a bit, because you know, you know that you're buying regularly, right? You're not buying daily, but you might be buying weekly, certainly monthly. You're dollar cost averaging in. And by dollar cost averaging, I mean, you're spending the same amount. So like you, you, you don't try and guess whether the price is gonna go up or down because you, you can never tell. I mean, you can't predict that. What you might do is you might say, oh, Bitcoin's a really good price. I'm going to put all my money in this week because I think it's, it's, it's at a bottom. And then what will happen is it will go down 10, 20, 30%. And you think, I wish I'd kept a bit of money to buy it when it had gone lower. And Or you might think, oh, I'm going to sell it all. I'm going to sell it all because I think it can't possibly ever get up to this peak again. And I'm going to <clears throat> put it all back into fiat pounds. And then I'm going to wait for the price to drop because it's unsustainable. And then when it's gone down 10, 20, 30%, I'm going to buy it all back because I'll know when the bottom is. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have 30% more Bitcoin as a result. Result, you know, go me, genius. Stand back, genius at work. And then, of course, you sell it all. And what happens is it goes up 10, 20, 30, 90%. So by the time you frantically bought it all back, you're, uh, you've only got 70% of what you had before. <laughs> so my advice is don't try and time your purchases. Put in the same amount on a periodic, periodic basis. And by periodic, I mean uh, the same amount in fiat, fiat government money terms. So let's say don't, don't buy one Bitcoin a month, one Bitcoin a month, for every month buy a Bitcoin. Put in, let's say, I don't know, 5,000 a month or something. And then the next month put 5,000 in. And then the next month put 5,000 in. And if you do it that way, then what will happen is, when the price is high, you won't buy so much. So when you come to look at the price that you bought your Bitcoin for, you'll realize that you didn't really buy much at the top. And then the next month, let's say the price has come down and you still put 5,000 in, then you get more Bitcoin for, the, for your 5,000 than you would have done if you'd spent it the week before or, the, or possibly next week. So this is not an opinion, this is a mathematical fact. If you're converting one asset into another, one currency into another, the best way to do it, where, where they, they fluctuate in price against each other, and you can't really tell uh, 
when and what is the best time to buy, then you do a thing called dollar cost averaging, which is basically uh, putting the same amount, spending the same amount uh, every period and then getting a variable amount of what you're trying to convert into every period. And then when you do the maths over a long period of time, you won't find that you've got the most, uh, but you won't find that you've got the least either. What you'll find is that you've got the best that you could have done bearing in mind that you're buying blind you know that and you can't predict the price so and that's what I've done I've done I've put uh, whenever we've got a bit of spare money in the bank uh, the business I um, I put it into Bitcoin and it works out about five thousand pounds a month something like that so we've got we haven't made massive gains at the moment but we certainly haven't made a loss I'll, um, I don't, uh, I don't put it all into Bitcoin BTC, and I don't put it all into Bitcoin Cash BCH. So uh, what I what I do invest in is obviously, uh, you know, you have to do your own research on that, do your own due diligence, have a little look and see what you fancy. But uh, But uh, no, we're we're ahead. In other words, we've got more money in our exchange account than uh, we would have if we just kept it in the bank in the bank account. You know, and the other thing I think with the bank account is that you, um, you know, supposing you get thirty thousand pounds in the bank, right? And you're thinking to yourself, well, I, what can I buy? I can buy whatever I buy. It has to be for the practice, wholly and exclusively, because uh, you know, for tax reasons. And so you start looking around the practice and thinking, oh, shall I buy this bit of kit or that bit of kit, or you know, shall I buy an APG or blah? blah. So you end up just spending it for the sake of it, you know. Whereas if you've got it invested in something, and then and your bank account has only got about five thousand pounds in it, you go back to that delightful state where you start thinking, "Oh, I better do a bit of work," you know, and I wonder if I'll be able to pay the staff at the end of the month. Which is, although although you know, it's a desperate situation to be in if that's the situation that you're in. If you're wondering whether you're going to be able to pay the staff at the end of the month out of your current account, uh, while well, knowing that you've got a you know 30 grand or something on deposit, uh, then uh, you know you, you don't get quite so stressed. But I still I think that you should really actively manage your money. I think if you've got so much money in your bank account that you're you don't care what you buy or you know you don't care what you pay you don't care what hours the staff work overtime etc uh, I mean that's a nice position to be in perhaps you should be in that situation <laughs> no I've always uh, I've always actively managed my money to the extent that we always uh, type everything into an accounting program balance the bank account and we can pull off a management profit and loss balance sheet at any time, any time. Um, what that does is that allows you to make decisions about how to run your business in real time, you know. Like, is the hygienist profitable? Is the lack of a hygienist profitable? How much money uh, are you making? Uh, how much of your turnover, you know, is uh, plan-based? How much... Um, and then you can then look at your time graph and see how much of your time is taken up by plan patients. And so if, uh, like in our case, I think about 12% of our time, 12% uh, of our income is from the plan patients, but about 20% of our time is taken up on the plan patients. So you can say, all right, well, uh, you know, your plan patients are getting too much. They're getting £10 notes for a fiver. Well, 
I mean, I suppose, look, if you look at the figures, they are. Except that the thing is that the 20% of the time that I spend on the plan patients is nothing. You know, we don't do anything. on it. It's just like having a chat and just, uh, you know, possibly giving them a scale and polish. Um, but what you can do, I mean, is you, you can, for example, you can... Uh, know that when it comes to fee setting at the end of the year you can put your fees up say five ten percent for the plan patients knowing two things one is that they they are already getting excellent value for money they're getting more out than they're putting in so you can adjust the fees up with a clear conscience and secondly and um, that when they say to you you know oh I see the plan fees have gone up again you've got something to say to them you can say to them yeah uh, we did a quick analysis and we found out that the plan contributes 12% to the running costs and takes up 20% uh, of the surgery time. So we've had to adjust it a bit, you know, we've had to balance it a bit. And they're like, oh, okay. Right, lot of nothing today, eh? Just make you rich, though. All right, I'll uh, talk to you soon. Bye.